first speaker is Chris Yule, who is going to speak on a topic that we're probably all at least somewhat aware of, which is the project that happened at Camelback Mountain to um, close the Echo Canyon Trail and Trailhead um, and you know all of that that went into it and I think a little bit about what's happening since it reopened. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm uh, Chris Ewell. I'm a landscape architect um, in the City of Phoenix Parks and Recreation Department. Um, I've been with the city almost 14 years now. Um, actually managed the design and construction of this building, so it's kind of nice to come back. Um, uh, okay, figured out how to use it. Um, so the other images are just to kind of get you thinking a little bit. Um, I got to go to Yellowstone this summer, um, and it was before we really started fully constructing Echo Canyon. And it gave me a kind of little insight of what was to come at Echo Canyon, and it wasn't far off. Um, if you've never been to Yellowstone, um, I suggest you, you try, but don't go in the summer. It's not a good time to go. And if you go to Echo Canyon, don't go in the winter. This is pretty busy. This is a nice shot. Um, fairly far away from uh, Camelback Mountain. Most people know it today like that, with the houses crawling up the sides of it. Um, a lot of people don't realize either that we don't actually own most of the mountain. A lot of the mountain has actually um, been protected by the um, Phoenician on one end. They actually own a big piece of it on the Choya side. Um, and then of course, when you, once you figure out all the properties that actually creep up and around, it's quite a bit of it actually we don't own. But the majority of it is protected by the city. Uh, local context map, um, in case you're not sure, there are two trails that are designated trails. There's other trails that do go up Camelback Mountain, but, um, uh, sorry, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to bounce around too much. Um, on the right, the Choya Trail, on the left is Echo Canyon. Most people really do go to Echo Canyon because it's the most well-known, um, and it's adjacent to a community called Echo Canyon Estates, which plays into this process quite a bit. Um, so first I'm going to talk about the trailhead itself, and um, the whole public process, because I know that's really what was promoted as the speaker, is going to be integrated throughout, so it's not just a focused thing on public process. That's what it used to look like, um, fairly small, beautiful uh, portable toilets that have been there for many, many years, a um, little Ramada that was actually built by staff, and the main thing was you get, it, get, it, get there, if you can get a space, you jump out of your car, you hike, you come back, you leave. That was, that's pretty much the experience that most people had. And some people hiked three, four times. We actually do have somebody that runs it three times each day, up and down. So this is the old configuration. Um, the north is on your left, McDonald Drive. Um, McDonald Drive actually separates Phoenix from Paradise Valley. Paradise Valley is on the left and includes these houses here. Those are actually all in Paradise Valley. Um, we had 16 parking spaces on Echo Canyon Parkway and then 52 uh, spaces up in the actual trailhead. When this lot was developed um, years and years ago, hiking was something that um, people who hug trees and you know, lived in the backwoods kind of did. It was not an urban, popular thing to do. Um, it, there was no idea that hiking in Phoenix would ever become extremely popular. Um, why would anybody want to climb up to the top of a mountain? It's too far. So the things to do, why not go to Disneyland or something instead? Um, but what's interesting is that this property in here, and here we actually got from this developer of that community. There's 83 homes in that community. Um, some fairly well-known architects, engineers live in this community as well as business owners. Uh, it's fairly affluent, um, most of this region is. And what was happening is we were having lots of issues with backups in here and people trying to get out. 
So you know, we had the 68 um, spaces. Paradise Valley had taken every on-street parking within a mile to two miles of the trailhead was blocked off. You would get a ticket, it's $85 if I remember correctly, and they would happily give you the ticket. Um, and there was people that didn't care. Every week they would get another ticket. They wanted to hike, no matter what. Um, Echo Canyon uh, Estates, and then public uh, safety. About two thirds of our mountain rescues, at up to a minimum, are at Echo Canyon every year. Um, before we closed, I think we had like 75 one year. Not all of those result in death, but there's a number that do. Um, it's, it's, it's not, I won't say it's dangerous, but it's, it's not the safest place in the world to go. So this was your experience when you try to get a parking space on a busy day, like today. Um, spring training going on. It's uh, extremely busy. Um, spring training is one of our biggest bumps, sort of like Christmas uh, holiday season. Um, and in fall break, actually, we get a decent. Once the weather starts cooling off a little bit, suddenly we get a spike during that time. Uh, climbing on Thanksgiving has become popular, too. So this is your experience if you're trying to get out of your house at Echo Canyon Estates. Um, years ago, we've had fist fights. We've had um, just people smashing each other with their cars. Um, we've had people try to run over people with their cars. So it's, it's, you're going to this place to enjoy the beauty of it. And instead, you're getting into, you're getting angry and frustrated and you're not liking it too much. But the media is promoting, go hike Echo Canyon. If you fly on Southwest Airlines, they used to, Southwest and US Airways, they used to have it in the brochure. So go to Phoenix, hike, hike Camelback Mountain. <laughs> go to Echo Canyon. We're like, no, no, go somewhere else. <laughs> go to the county, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, this is uh, myself getting to do a media interview with David Urbanata, our public information officer. And this is when we actually had a plan in place, so everybody was really curious what we were going to do. Um, but media attention was always pretty high. Um, but we've had the parking problem for a long time. The parking problem has been a problem for some say 30 years. I think it's more like the 20 to 25 year range myself. We get about 400,000 guests per year. 68 parking spaces. They're not too hard. And that's just that Boy, it's probably another two, 300,000. Wow. So it's kind of do the math if you want. It's, it's, it's just not enough. Um, but then again, go more, maybe more would come. We did a major trail renovation um, on steps back in 2001. It was actually held up by the um, September 11th uh, attack. We were flying helicopters and moving railroad ties up into the, the mountains to replace old worn out ones. And that project was uh, put on hold for a couple weeks. The trail condition, um, if you've been up there, I've got some photos of a couple to show you. It was pretty bad. And air pollution, believe it or not, became an issue because people were idling. Some people would idle for two hours. Mm -hmm waiting for a parking space. So if you ever watch those people at the mall that are waiting for that one spot, it's like three spots closer to the mall than the other spots that are available. Imagine that, but exacerbated. So I got involved about two and a half years ago. Staff had been trying to just manage this thing. Um, we had three rangers out there all the time, and they basically were traffic cops is what they've become. The, and every ranger that we had working there absolutely hates it. If they get yelled at, they get spit at, they get stuff thrown at them, you know, you name it. It's, you know, they're there because they're, they love the mountain, they, they want to be outside, they like the outdoors, they love resource preservation, and instead they're being traffic police. So it was, it was a really challenging situation. Um, they were trying to figure out some things internally in operations on how to make traffic flow better and then finally, management and elected officials just said, you need to do something. We're getting way too many complaints. It's, it's not looking good for us. So you need to do something. So um, approximately two years ago, we <coughs> conducted a study with CK Group um, to take a look at options. 
Um, there was some shuttle services that were being offered in the area, pretty low cost, a couple, three bucks. You could go park at like Town of Paradise Valley and be brought over. Um, and then they would go and drop you off when you were done hiking. Some people were going as far away as, um, I know of people that actually park at Papago Park and they would ride their bikes over, which it's not a bad thing in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and some would even come farther than that. Biking to this <coughs> location is still one of the best ways to get there, just for future reference. Um, so said, let's take a look at what we can do. Um, the very first meeting that we had, I had the consultants sit in the very back, we didn't have them tell who they were, it was at the town of Paradise Valley, we had 125 plus people at the meeting. Um, and it quickly got to where this, they just were so frustrated, the public, that they just you know, started yelling, screaming, interrupting each other. And I'm like, wow. I've been through this with Patriot Square, so, you know, we were gonna look at closing Patriots Park down, downtown, and some other projects where it had been, you know, people were very angry, but this was the most diverse group of angry people, if you will, that I had seen. <laughs> because you had, um, you know, Vice President of Bank of Chicago and you know, things, you know, people of that caliber coming in addition to the guy that you know, lives in his VW Bug and he climbs and climbs every week. Um, so it was, you know, it was hard to get consensus on what people really wanted. Um, some people just wanted us to outright close the mountain, get everybody off, don't ever let them back on. Just resources too degraded, they shouldn't be back there. Some people said we should build a two to three level parking garage um, and at least get in a thousand spaces. So that's what we started with. Um, what we did over the next six months, we, we did five public meetings and progressively we whittled down through concepts. We started out with looking at medians in the area that were just for traffic. How many sp spots can we fit in there? I mean, can we just squeeze in there? Even if it was a mile away, people didn't care. They said that they would, they would park there. So what would happen is we would have, okay, this meeting over here, we're gonna put in 300 spaces. Just, it's not a real number, but. So everybody that lived around that meeting would say, I don't want that, you can't do that. And so every option that came through was kind of the same thing. Um, people said either just, you know, you're gonna to have to limit people. And that's, that's really what you're gonna to have to do. You're just not gonna allow, you're gonna maybe gonna allow more, some more people, but you're not gonna allow everybody in there that wants to go there. And, and that's just a fact. I mean, there's a small hole and lots of people that wanna to go to that location. Um, we even worked with uh, ASU, Dr. White over at ASU. I don't know if any of you know him. Um, and he was taking a look at capacity study for us. It was gratis, it was free. Um, he had done work at uh, Yosemite and taking a look at how that worked. Um, but on our timeline, it wasn't really easy for him to kind of conduct the research that he really needed to do. So we never really truly got a strong, you know, 500 people a day can go to Camelback. And that's what the public wanted us to say that the magic number for parking spaces is X, and that the magic number for amount of people on the mountain is Y. We never got that number. Um, and I knew going into it that that's just not a number that you can truly quantify. Um, you know, someplace like Disneyland does have a certain number of people that can go through there each day because they have a square footage type deal. And uh, Disney World actually closed and, and uh, Christmas time, because they got too many people. So people were like, we just need to close the mountain, don't let anybody on there, let's, um, and let's just move on. Let them, let them go somewhere else. We just said that's not possible. Um, we can't tell you what's the capacity, but we're, we're just gonna say that's not possible. So let's look at what we have. And what we had was an opportunity with the Echo Canyon Estates Homeowners Association. And I'm gonna give them some credit because um, one of their architects that lives in the neighborhood, um, and I won't plug him, but anyway, um, they came up with a concept on their own that took one of ours and kind of tweaked it. 
And it actually is what became Exhibit 14. That's our infamous Exhibit 14. There were 13 other exhibits before 14. So you can see how many we kind of went through in that six month process. And what it resulted in was, this is the old entrance drive into the park. This was an actual HOA tract that was left over. They said, you give us the road, which is a public right of way, and we'll exchange that for you with our property so you can expand your parking lot. We'll both get an entrance. We won't have conflicts with people trying to go in our entrance or your entrance. Um, it's not going to cost you anything other than the design and construction. Um, and they saw it as a win-win. As a now, of course, then we've got the naysayers that said, boy, this whole project is about building a private driveway for HOA. Well, not really, because they're the ones that kind of, they did come to us, but they're the ones that, if anything, they had something to lose the most if this didn't work, because it could just get worse than what it already was. Um, so we, we took a look at it for a while um, and found that actually this was one of the best concepts that we had um, to work with. One thing that did get added is kind of a modified roundabout upon McDonald Drive. Uh, McDonald is a 25 mile an hour road. Um, we were going to slow traffic down to 15 with the roundabout and then give people a chance to kind of see where they were supposed to go. That was the idea that you could get traffic to flow a little better, but also, oh wait, I'm not supposed to turn into the HOA entrance. I There's the sign for Echo Canyon, I'll go there. Um, so what we ended up getting, and this number is actually a, a little off. It's actually 135 spaces. Um, all the other amenities that are in there, we did um, accomplish. There was a few tweaking that we did. Things that we also were able to do here is we had a bike rack that had, I think, enough for seven or eight bikes. We now have space for 30 bicycles yeah, designated. You can still uh, tie it to a tree or something if you absolutely needed to. Um, we actually added six motor motorcycle parking spaces, which, believe it or not, those actually do get full because people have figured out that, hey, I can drive my motorcycle over there, and there's always parking for that. Um, and so we got to um, the point where we took this to the Parks Board um, in May of 2012. Uh, 12. I've got it here on the next slide. There we go. 12, correct. And then our Parks and Recreation Board approves master plans for anything larger than a neighborhood park, which obviously this location is larger than a neighborhood park. So they, they did approve the plan. Uh, we had a few naysayers, but a majority of people said, this is what we want. The hiking community said, we like the extra parking. We like that you're actually gonna try to improve the trailhead for us. You're gonna give us a flushable toilet and you're gonna give us chilled water. They had water in the past, but the water barely even spit out. So you really have to bring your home. Um, Paradise Valley said, we like that you're taking care of the traffic problem. We thought. We like that um, it's helping with traffic calming, you know, on McDonald. Uh, our council likes that we may not get as many complaints anymore. The HOA said, you know, obviously we're getting what we want. Um, and then, if you will, the, I don't want to say the preservationists, but the, the purists that said, you know, that wanted us to close it, they said, well, at least you're not making it a thousand space parking lot. So there won't be as many people. And one other component that we did add that wasn't necessarily in the master plan was an education component. Educate the public on where they are, what they're there, and that the resource isn't infinite, and um, it can be damaged, can be destroyed, and that you need to respect it. Um, or you could get hurt, or you could hurt that environment as well. So this is kind of the timeline. Um, from May to, uh, 12 up to January of 13, um, we were actually still in design, and um, we got started a little later than what we were thinking, um, but everybody said, hold on, hold on, we can't just go close this thing at the start of the hiking season. The hike, you know, start of hiking season for us is usually October-ish. 
Um, and that's when we were looking at closure. It's like, well, let's, let's let them hike a little bit. We're gonna affect hiking season no matter what. So we had another public meeting, surprisingly not very well attended, um, other than the news media. <coughs> the news media came, a few of the outlets came, and they wanted to know when we were gonna close. So we said, you know, I got to be the one to say, January 29th, it's your last day. You can hike in the, I think it was in the morning, and then we shut it down. And um, still they came. It didn't matter how much media we did, we put it in the newspaper, we made it on TV, everything, and we still had people, wait, why is it closed? I just got here from Canada. You gotta open it. And I had a guy literally say, you, you have to. Because I'm from Canada. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> you could be from Mars, but I'm still not gonna open it because it's closed. Um, and we started demolition, and um, we actually started working on trail reroute as well. That's another piece of the project that we're talk about here in a minute. Um, we got some input from the public that, you know, a lot of them like the stairs. I don't know how many of you hiked there, um, but it was like being on a stair climber for the first half mile. Uh, it was just railroad ties and it was one right after another. And um, honestly, even myself, it just beat me up and I, that's why I never liked going there. It's just, it's just not my thing. Um, but one of the things that our trails coordinator looked at was how can we remove all that? It's just eroding. It's ugly, it's not natural, um, it's not comfortable, and you spend the whole time doing this as you're hiking. You're looking at the ground, you're trying to make sure you don't trip or you know, hurt yourself. And so we, we had a plan for the reroute, which I'll show you in a second. The major parking lot improvement started in April and we reopened the trailhead. Um, it was supposed to be at the end of November. I don't know how many of you saw that in the news. I'm sorry. It was, we ended up opening in January. We had a, we had a delay from our contractor that kind of threw things off. Some of the uh, components for our restrooms and structures wasn't, weren't ready. So they told us a date and it was wrong. And so I had to go and kind of eat crow and say sorry. Which didn't make people happy, especially the people that were kind of conspiracy theorists that thought you know, we were just doing all this for the HOA. Like, well, you're just making it closed even longer just for, just for them. So it was all over the news, you know, Echo Canyon closing. And, um, you know, some people um, were really upset. But mo most people were really excited. They were wanting to see what we were going to do. So we, we started taking down the features. <coughs> that large barrel, that's a barrel cactus in the middle. Actually, it was already leaning. We didn't pursue it. We did save all of the native plant resources. Um, we had over 100 trees that we saved, and I don't know how many saguaros that were in this, this range. It was probably 50, plus we had some really nice large ones. Um, we even saved the skeleton, which we still don't know what to do with. <laughs> so this is what we ended up with. It's the roundabout, um, and uh, this is actually from one of those little uh, Hella cam, um, mm -hmm. drone, drones, yeah. little drone cameras turned out really good. And now we found out that they're actually illegal. it's actually illegal for you to have a commercial operation to do that. Um, but we got some nice photos. So this is what it looked like um, just before we opened. Nice traffic flowing through. Uh, this is actually the day before we opened, and the fire department is actually doing training out here. Um, Echo Canyon is a place that Mountain Rescues, and I think the county deals with this a lot, but Mountain Rescues is um, very challenging, it's very technically oriented, very, you don't need a lot of skill, and you never know what kind of equipment, so send everything. So whenever there's a Mountain Rescue at Echo Canyon, there's eight vehicles that come, and it's consistent. It doesn't matter if it's here or Piesta, why you get eight vehicles. So. There's a few of them in the park out there. So we had three different crews that had to come and train again because it had been almost a year. We closed, we closed Echo Canyon for all, just shy of a year. Um, during that time, we had people sneaking in. We had people that, you know, it was like a badge of honor to say I, I hiked. But what's interesting is we'd only, we only actually closed about a half a mile of the trail. You could still climb down into the cliff if you're familiar with the area. You could get into those areas. Um, the areas you couldn't get to was where people base jump, 
uh, which is a totally different issue. I'm not going to address that one today. Um, and some of the climbing areas were a little harder to get into. So this was, this was the final product on the upper lot. And then this is the connector, roundabout. This is Tatum, 44th Street. This is the new entrance into the HOA. This is parking. And this is our <coughs> private residence. Uh, and then the trailhead is down here. Some of the things that we did was we actually tried to improve upon that experience of get out your car, maybe get a drink of water, go hike, leave. Um, we tried to make it a spot that you could gather a little bit if you needed to. We didn't want people having a picnic there. It's a, it's a day use facility that's really active recreation based. It's not someplace where you go and take the family and hang out for hours and, and have lunch. Um, we have t benches, but no tables. We did not want to encourage people to, to hang out any longer than necessary, but that we wanted them to have a good experience while they were there. Um, and that was one of the things that we heard from the community was that there's nothing to tell you how dangerous it can be. What do you need to get prepared to go there? I've seen three-year-olds up there. I've seen people in flip-flops that honestly look like they're about to blow out. You know, they, they just crawled out of bed and they're gonna go hiking and they don't have any water and they have no sunscreen, they don't have a hat. And you just know in about an hour or two, you're gonna get the call. And it, it's actually happened when I've been up there um, several times. So we've got, and this is where the rules sign goes. You know, our government, we got to tell, state the rules. Um, and then we put in interpretive signage in here and in here. This in here actually tells you, you know, things, nice things about, you know, it's geology and the flora and the fauna, stuff that you, nobody ever, you know, was actually promoting at the time. This signage in here was trying to catch your attention one of the facts that's on there is that hiking to the top of Camelback Mountain is the same as if you took all the stairs to the top of the Empire State Building from the first floor. I don't know how many of you want to do that, but I have no desire to do that. And, and I don't think it discourages people, but it makes them think a little bit. And that's our goal, uh, is to make them think a little bit before they go out. Um, so onto the trail. So this is what the trail looked like. In some places, it was 25 feet wide, um, which this was a trail that went right up a ridge, which we don't encourage any longer because of erosion. Um, the railroad ties were added over the years just because everything else eroded away. It's a very um, loose material that's up there for the first half of your, your journey through Echo King. And this is some of it. Those little dents, this one's actually almost six inches deep. That's where people's feet constantly stepping on those. And a lot of these were replaced in 2001. So you see how many people are going through. Some people say build stone steps. They built stone steps and they actually just wear them out almost faster, amazingly enough. Uh, we actually redesigned the trail. So this is the trailhead. This is the old trail. It went right up. This is the ridge line. And this is actually a wash. You walk, climb through a rock or a wash. This is a very popular climbing rock. We rerouted the trail out and about, and actually, this is the cliff face. Hmm. So it did a couple of things. It actually got you closer to the mountain, so you could only go a quarter of a mile and see it, which a lot of people just like feel like they want to touch it, and then you could turn around if you felt like you needed to. Um, you don't have to do this anymore. <coughs> which is nice. You can actually look around. Um, the trail bed right now looks like it's like 10 to 12 feet wide, but it's actually a six foot wide trail bed. And uh, it's all natural. It's all native soil. Uh, there's no steps in this section at all. And so, um, so far we've gotten like huge, huge applause for this. We got a lot of criticism at first because we were tearing up new area from from some people, but now I think that all those have been kind of won over to our side, if you will. Um, and we actually, in the process of revegetating the old trail bed. 
this is part of that revegetation process. Getting a lot of the boulders and such down there, getting the, the duff, debris. The duff is just like stuff that falls from the trees. They put it down in here and just kind of let, give areas for plants to kind of take root. This is the new trail. Ignore the tire tracks. <laughs> we don't allow vehicle traffic. We don't allow bikes either. Um, it, it would be actually be a pretty fun ride, but you, know, you can't ride bikes on it. This is too many people. You, you get in conflict. So the old trail is actually here. The new trail, obviously here. And this is fairly consistent how it looks along the way. So the negative, if you will. Um, and we just had it in the in the newspaper. I think it was yesterday. It was an editorial, and they weren't really slamming the city. I don't think so much. They were just trying to state the facts. And this was kind of the message: if you build it, they will come. Um, so we expanded the parking. The word got out. And, hey, they doubled the parking spaces in Echo Canyon. So much better. You need to go. <laughs> Our number one user group would have never expected it. People that have lived in Phoenix that have either never gone to Camelback or they stopped going to Camelback because it was too busy. It's better, let's go. So they all come. And before nine o'clock, you can't get a parking space for I don't know how long. We don't allow queuing anymore. Um, and um, so what we've had to do is we've had to do another PR campaign to tell people to go somewhere else. It sounds counterintuitive, but um, I, I won't say it's necessarily working, but at least people are kind of understanding a little bit when they come that there is a limit. With any resource, there is a limit. It's hard to find where that limit is, I think. I don't know that you can really measure it, per se, right away. But you know, 135 parking spaces, they only turn over every hour to two hours. And as soon as one opens up, we've got somebody waiting for it. Um, the only time that it's not super busy, and if you want to go there, I suggest you go after 10 o'clock <laughs> on a weekday and stay away on a weekend. It's just, it's, it's just too busy. Use or misuse what you've done. So impatience. Um, we have people that are amazingly impatient, more so than they were when it was the old lot. You know. It's, it's actually worse now for our staff than it was before. Um, and we had somebody actually tell our park ranger yesterday that was at the main gate, you need to identify all the people that are not residents of Phoenix and kick them out. <laughs> I pay my taxes in Phoenix, this is for Phoenicians, and you need to kick them all out. And I'm like, how are we going to do that? <laughs> Everybody doesn't have like a little stamp on their arm that says, I'm from Scottsdale. Um, attitude. Uh, if they've already sat in their car and trying to get into a parking space or they've gone around the roundabout 20 times, which some people try to do, or they've just stopped in the middle of the roundabout, which they do, or they stop in the middle of Tatum Boulevard, we had a mile backup on Tatum the first week that we opened. Um, you would have thought it was a rock concert or something because it was a really happening place. Um, we had to kind of check pe what people's attitudes really are and what are they trying to say throughout the process. I've had to really pay attention, not necessarily what they're saying, but what they're meaning. Um, and, and that was something that um, was actually kind of a learning experience for myself. Uh, people come unprepared. I already said about the flip-flops and everything else. They, they, they have this an anticipation that you've done something better for them, so it should be perfect. Um, and um, they're not prepared for disappointment. And they're impatient already, so then they get angry. And there's a lot of people that are inexperienced. And they don't know what they're getting into. <clears throat> I don't like to say that Camelback's a dangerous place because it's really not. Echo Canyon is not a dangerous place. It's those that are inexperienced, you know, they're unprepared, they're already angry because they're impatient. Um, and, 
share this.